He's the All-American quarterback who has wowed and inspired football fans with his never-say-die competitive spirit. He took a bad team to the playoffs, and he was the reason. Whether playing for high school, college, or the pros, he has brought his all to the game, yet kept true to his faith and family. I mean, we all knew he was great and something special. He's as advertised. The, uh, the aura that is Tim Tebow just makes me speechless because everything people says this man can do, he will do. He's a man who has defied the odds and the critics practically from the moment he was born, all the way to the monumental second season playing for the Denver Broncos. And he doesn't look set to stop anytime soon. Everyone forecasts doom and gloom on Tebow as a quarterback in the NFL. So far, they've been wrong. He has been successful. He's the miracle baby, born to missionaries, and no matter his fame and fortune, he continues to preach the Gospels and do charitable work for others. All he's done is won and thank the Lord. Anytime I get the opportunity, I always um, thank my Lord and Savior Jesus Christ because that is the most important thing to me. Off the field and on the field, he brings the same commitment to excellence. And let no one forget, he's a man who inspires love, loyalty, and respect. Tim Tebow. Timothy Richard Tebow was born on August 14, 1987, in Makati City, the Philippines, the fifth child to parents Pamela and Robert Tebow. Right from the start, Tim was beating the odds. Tim's parents were missionaries in the Philippines, and Tim's uh, mom was pregnant. And doctors told her that because of some complications that had arisen, it might be best if they terminated the pregnancy. And they're obviously very strong in their faith and, and felt very strongly about not doing that. And, and you know, they were able to, to go through the entire pregnancy, and Tim was born in the Philippines. And, you know, that's kind of the beginning of the legend of Tim Tebow. You know, if, depending on who you talk to, he probably shouldn't even been born or been in the world. But, uh, you know, it started off uh, there, and then his legend just kind of grew from there. When Tim was three years old, the Tebow family returned to the United States and settled in the Jacksonville area. The Tebows continued their missionary work and founded an orphanage in the Philippines. And this has continued to be central to Tim's life. Young Tim grew up in a supportive family, playing a variety of sports with his two brothers on the family farm and for the local Pop Warner teams. They did settle up here in, in, in the northwest part of Jacksonville on a farm. Uh, grew up over there, played uh, in Little League and, and Pop Warner Football Lakeshore, which is on the west side of Jacksonville. And, uh, you know, just kind of grew up in that area and ended up, you know, starting to play high school football at Trinity Christian High School, which is also on the west side, a private parochial school, and, and didn't kind of fit in there, I guess. They wanted him to play defensive end because he's always been a big kid. And eventually, you know, they decided we want Tim to have a shot to play quarterback. So he ended up at Nice High School to play for Craig Howard. You know, Tim was homeschooled. Uh, so the family did have to move uh, into the Nice School District, which is in St. Johns County. Him and his mom moved over there and stayed in an apartment there while he went to Nice. Uh, and he was homeschooled uh, by his mom, like all his brothers and sisters were. And then he would show up in the afternoon and play football and go to practice and hang out and do all the stuff with his teammates and play for Nice on Friday nights. And that's kind of how he went through the rest of his high school career till he signed at Florida. He's a leader, born natural leader. When he got here, you know, there was a lot of hype about him. A lot of the kids that we went to school with played with him in uh, other sports and stuff growing up. And it's hard to believe hype sometimes you hear a lot of stuff, but he was, uh, he was pretty amazing watching him. Him being the same age as all of us and everything, he was way more progressed than we were. When he first arrived, he, as a ninth grader in the spring, walking into a situation where he knew nobody, he immediately took the leadership role, was the strongest kid on the team as a ninth grader, and from there drove his teammates to get bigger, stronger, and eventually led us to the achievements. Uh, struggled first year, went with, with a broken leg in the ninth game of the year, because I wasn't able to play the tenth game, finished the season five and five but the two following years going 11 and two, then 13 and two, and just brought his teammates up and did everything with, that he could in his power to make everybody a winner. He was always the, the best leader and motivator I've ever seen. I mean, he 
people follow him naturally. It's like, no matter what, I mean, anybody follows him, people get behind him. And he was a, always the hardest working kid on the team, in the weight room, on the practice field, you know, any time he was always outworking everybody and made everybody around him be better. He always voiced himself as the, uh, the dominant, you know, captain of the team. Honestly, the first time I heard it was about two days before he showed up and everyone was talking about, we got this new quarterback coming in, uh, really big guy, he's gonna make us work hard. And at first I didn't think anything of it, but then, you know, the first time you see him, it's like, wow, look at this kid's stature. And all right, now we gotta, we gotta start working harder to kind of get like him. As far as his work ethic, uh, you would go into the weight room, he was leading, he was doing the most of anyone, whether, whatever, exercise it was, whatever lift it was. Intensity was his main focus. I mean, he came in, we were kind of a lackadaisical team. Uh, we would sometimes, if we would get down by 14 points, we would think that was it, um, even in the first quarter. Uh, in the weight room, if we couldn't you know, hit all our reps in a set, we would just say, oh, well, maybe next time. But uh, ever since the first minute he showed up, he was always pushing guys, even the backups, to just get better and better. He was always telling us that you know, we can do it if we put our mind to it. And uh, in the locker room, he changed everything from a kind of a lackadaisical atmosphere to one of just pure intensity and pure want to play the game for the love of it. He played a state game. We were, it was kind of getting tight in like the fourth quarter, and he was you know, being a team leader and everything. He was kind of getting nervous, so he begged the coaches to put him in a defensive line. He went in, and uh, he did all right. He held his own. Nah, it wasn't like he was playing quarterback, but he, uh, he did all right. It was pretty funny to watch. Very first season that Tim Tebow came here, we were playing our homecoming game. And uh, third quarter comes up, and uh, Tim takes a low hit from, I believe it was the left side, and fractured his, uh, his leg. And coaches are saying, well, you know, it's, it's probably a fracture, it's a sprain, like, we'll take you out, it's okay, we'll go with on you. And he was just so adamant, talking to our head coach, Coach Howard, saying, no, I'm here, I'm playing, you can't stop me, I'm going back in the game. And he ran for a touchdown for 25 yards on a broken leg. If we look back in hindsight, he could have ended his career on that play. So at that moment, we knew that at least in terms of heart, in terms of dedication, in terms of intensity, Tim Tebow was the real deal. Sophomore year, yeah, he broke his, he had a, the, I, guess, I don't know which bone, a non-weight bearing bone in his leg. Um, he broke it and he played, played the whole game with it. I think he ran for a couple touchdowns. But then our senior year, he had a bad high ankle sprain in a game and, and uh, he played the rest of the season with it and the rest of that game running on it. They just put a hard cast on it and tape it up before every game and he'd go out. That's hard to, hard to get a high school kid to do a lot of times. Um, the Hoover game, when we played on ESPN, that was pretty cool. Um, we played, uh, I think it was Lake City, Columbia, and he had a, uh, a high ankle sprain he got in that game, and he played the whole game with it, and it was pretty bad injurious. You know, that shows you how tough somebody is when you see stuff like that. Athletically, he was out there to make everybody better. Uh, we have a game where a senior wide receiver was throwing the ball three consecutive plays, the exact same play, just so he could have a touchdown catch from Tebow during his career. It was the only time he scored. He was a very marginal player, and it was very much Timmy's drive telling everybody he wanted to do this, one of his good friends. And when he was in high school, we weren't as able to do as many of the things that we wanted to as a team oriented activities with seven on seven passing turns because he was in the Philippines. And the only thing he asked from us, other than the blessing to go, was a football to take with so he could still be there doing stuff. And he, it was a known entity. It was one of those things that we said, we're not gonna have Timmy during the summer because he's off doing this. And it was full blessing from everybody on the staff and understood what that was the important aspect of his life. And we couldn't change that. And we weren't gonna try to change that. When he was here, he would go with the coach and a couple other of his teammates and go to the elementary schools, talk to those young children about character, about what they should be doing and what they are doing. And uh, he really uh, was a, an impressive young man. So it's no surprise to see the success that this young man has and the impact that he has made on so many, many people. Wrapping up his phenomenal high school football career, there were questions about where Tebow was going to play for his college career. Eventually, he picked the alma mater of his parents, the University of Florida at Gainesville, home of the legendary Gators. 
you know, being here in Jacksonville, I obviously knew about Tim and, and knew about the records he was setting. He was smashing records and how great of a player he was. But, you know, as the legend grew, as, it, you know, he, he's playing on TV, I guess they played uh, Hoover uh, on TV, that uh, team in uh, Alabama. You know, and, and, and that's when I really, the first time I really got to see him play. And, you know, at that point I kind of realized, you know, he's already a big recruit. But at that point, I realized not only is this kid a phenomenal player, he's the perfect fit for Urban Meyer spread offense. Well, part of why he came to Florida and to play for Urban Meyer was Urban was running a spread offense. If you know a little something about the spread offense, it is conducive to a running quarterback or a dual threat quarterback. It spreads the field real wide. When he and I were both going into our freshman year of college, we were kind of talking about what we wanted to do. And all he could talk about was national championship. And all he wanted to do was focus all of his efforts on making sure that everyone around him was better, that the program was going to be better because of him, and that he was going to take it to the top tier level that it could be. You know, we talk about how competitive Tim is, and the first time that anybody really got to see that at the collegiate level. You know, we heard the story about him going in at defensive tackle at the end of the game in the state high school championship game, you know, because he wanted to make sure that they were able to win that game. Um, you know, he played on a broken leg in high school. We know that story too, but you know, one of the first things that the, the freshmen do in, 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 uh, when they get to UF, especially those that enroll early in January, is they take part in the off-season conditioning drills. Well, they're doing them in Florida gym, and Tim is so desperate to win those. It, it's driven so much and so competitive that he's diving across the finish line in the gym just to be the first finisher in whatever drill they're running. Well, he was on the team that won the national championship, but uh, he was a freshman then and he backed up Chris Leak and you saw that his leadership was there then. And we were all very excited, you know, thinking about the very the next year. I've always said that I'm a football player first and then a quarterback, although, you know, that is my dream. That's what I want to be and it's what I believe I am as a quarterback. He didn't start as a quarterback, obviously, right away. He played uh, in situational stuff, uh, you know, he was used mainly as a runner early in the season. You know, definitely the first huge play he made was a, at Tennessee, 2006, fourth and one. Uh, Chris Leak was the starting quarterback. He scrambled on third down, slid a yard short of the first down. Florida's trailing in the game, so they run out Tim Tebow on fourth and one. And everybody in Neyland Stadium, which holds 103,000 people, knew what was coming. Everybody watching on TV knew it was coming. Everybody in the press box knew what was coming. And Tebow took the handoff, went left, and gained two yards to convert the first down. And I think three plays later, Chris Leak threw a touchdown pass to Dallas Baker to win the game. You know, and that was the kind of impact that he made as a freshman mostly, mostly with his legs. I mean, he had a couple of, of games where he was able to throw the ball a ton. You know, notably the LSU game where he threw, I think, a couple of touchdown passes and ran for another. You know, he threw the jump pass. That was the first appearance of the jump pass to take Casey against LSU, uh, 2006, which Florida used effectively throughout the rest of his career. Uh, so he did make some contributions. Now, he didn't make big contributions in every game, but certainly those games right there were the two where he probably made the biggest contributions. I, I fully expected them to win the national championship all four years with them there. Unfortunately, it happened twice, but I mean, that is still one heck of a record right there. Well, probably my favorite Tim Tebow moment on the field um, was the Braveheart game against Florida State in 2008. And it, you know, it was pouring that day in Tallahassee. And before the game, Urban Meyer talked about, I don't want to throw the football. We need to forget about throwing the football. Let's just run it all day. And Tim's response was the same as offensive coordinator Dan Mullen, who's now the coach of Mississippi State. They were like, l l relax, we'll just run the offense and we'll be fine. And that's exactly what they did. But it, it arranged so much that, that the paint on the field had run. And there's a great shot of Tim late in the game. His helmet's off. He's got garnet paint all down his face. His, his, his uniform is stained. And it, he just you know looked like Mel Gibson and Braveheart. And, and that was one of my favorite games to cover, just the emotion um, you know, of that game and, and, and how things worked out there. That was one of my favorite, uh, favorite games. Tebow was so beloved by the Gators fans that some of them found unique ways to express their appreciation for the All-American quarterback. Tim Trebo is a, a big chunk of wood, a, a tree outside of a restaurant in Gainesville, Ballyhoo, and uh, a local man decided he was going to make a, I guess, statue of Tim Tebow, and he carved it up into a guy looking like a football player, painted the jersey number on it, painted the helmet on there, and, 
everyone started calling it Tim Trebo. There was a tree that was dying right next to the Tiki Hut, and uh, we came up with the idea of carving it into a Tim Tebow likeness. And at the time uh, we did it, he was still in school. You know, NCAA rules prohibit an athlete's likeness from being used for anything like that. And I guess his likeness looked like a, you know, his tree, that tree looked enough like Tim that the NC, that uh, Florida and the NCAA say, yeah, we can't really have that. So the SEC Florida uh, had to send a cease and desist letter to uh, the uh, restaurant. Uh, we had to remove his number from the uh, likeness and put in uh, Danny Warfel's number, number seven, because he was also a Heisman Trophy winner here. But once Tim uh, graduated, we were able to put his number back on. On December 8, 2007, Tim Tebow was awarded the coveted Heisman Trophy. He was the first college sophomore in history to win the award, and he was the first homeschool student to achieve this, college football's most famous accolade. The first time I heard that he was going to be up for the Heisman as a sophomore, I thought it was just absolutely fantastic because, you know, coming back to, you know, the first day I saw him, we knew he was going to be a big deal, but we didn't realize how big he was going to be. And the fact that I had, you know, just a small role in helping him to get to that stage and even further, I just feel blessed at the opportunity to do what I did for him. I remember the 2008 Heisman Trophy ceremony where he didn't win. Okay, Sam Bradford won that year. And I remember talking to him after the ceremony, probably 10 or 15 minutes after the ceremony, and you could just tell by the way he answered and you could see it in his eyes, that while he was saying, you know, it's great, you know, I don't play this to win a Heisman Trophy, we want to win the national championship, you know, you could tell that he was angry, and you could tell that he was, he felt slighted and, and was really, really motivated to win that game because he, he was snubbed, he felt like he was snubbed that way. And, and that's just the competitiveness that he had throughout his entire career, throughout his entire life. He should have won the Heisman uh, as a sophomore year. Uh, his junior year, I thought he should have won it again. I thought the only reason why he didn't win it his junior year, first of all, Sam Bradford did have a terrific year. But I thought Tebow didn't win it because he won it the year before, and there's a bit of a backlash. Sometimes uh, you don't want a guy to win it merely because he's already had it. And uh, so I thought he should have, I thought he should have won it twice. And, even his senior year, I thought he was the uh, I thought he was the best player. I thought Tebow was the best college football player who ever played. He was just a, you know a great individual and a great leader, and people loved him. I mean, I don't know if there's any player in this in the University of Florida history that's ever been as loved as Tim Tebow. Given his success, Tim Tebow could have put himself up for the NFL draft before completing his college career, but true to form, he stayed at University of Florida loyal and committed to Coach Meyer and the Gators. You know, people think it was because he wasn't highly rated um, coming out as a junior that, uh, you know, the information that he got from the NFL's uh, committee was that he wasn't going to be a high draft pick, but that really wasn't it. He felt like he owed it to the University of Florida. He felt like he owed it to his teammates and he felt like he owed it to Urban Meyer and to himself. He made a promise to himself, I'm going to play four years at the University of Florida. And, you know, he felt like everything he felt like he got a lot of things from the University of Florida in terms of helping his him advance his platform, uh, helping him reach so many people with his message that, you know, he kind of felt like he owed the University of Florida and the fans and his teammates and his coaches another year. And, you know, it almost ended up with, with another national championship were, were it not for that loss to Alabama. Tim Tebow completed an amazing college career, graduating from the University of Florida in December 2009. But college football is one thing, while pro football is a whole different game altogether. You could not get around knowing who Tim Tebow was. But the real question was whether that notoriety on the collegiate level was going to transfer to the NFL. No doubt about it, there's a lot of scrutiny on him. But uh, Josh McDaniel saw something or heard something um, or, or said something that, that kind of triggered that Tebow should be his guy. I've always maintained that the best thing for Tim would have been to have been drafted by a team like New England or Indianapolis or New Orleans or Green Bay, teams with established starting quarterbacks who weren't going to be going anywhere for a while. So he could have several years to really kind of sit back and learn without a whole lot of pressure. 
Any quarterback coming out of the uh, NCAA first year, that's what you kind of want for them. You want them to learn about the game from an experienced player like, say, Peyton Manning or, or Dan Marino or John Elway type. Um, my take is that um, whenever you kind of jump into that and you're just thrown on the fire, it actually shows more character about how you handle it. The Broncos were looking at uh, drafting Tim Tebow. I actually thought they would take him at number 22. Uh, when they did select and then they traded back up at number 25 and took Tebow and uh, then it all made sense. The Denver Broncos were coming off a horrible year but Tim Tebow was so lightly regarded by scouts it didn't make sense in a football sense. Marketing, yes. Notoriety, yes. Franchise visibility, absolutely. You know whether you agree that Tebow should have been taken that high or not uh, but it made sense that the Broncos wanted him they got their guy. Tim Tebow's faith has been the one true constant during the turbulence of his early NFL career. In 2010, he created a foundation that is helping to fund a children's hospital in Davao City, the Philippines. And he continues his family's missionary work, sharing his Christianity at meetings in front of thousands. And then whatever happens, uh, you know that someone has a plan for your life. He supports so many charitable events, puts his time and effort to help other people. And if that's going to be his M.O., well, I'm going to put my arms around him and say, congratulations, Tim Tebow, because you're doing good things for other people. Now, uh, does the religion get in the way? Yeah, but he backs up his belief with his belief that the best thing he can do is help other people. And he doesn't. I covered Tim for, for four years at the University of Florida. I interviewed him hundreds of times. And never once did Tim ever um, make his religion or make his faith um, an issue. Well, I think, it, you know, he's an individual that's very close to God and it's important to him. And I think it's wonderful that he expresses himself in that way. And I think it's a good example to a lot of people in the world and the country. I think it's wonderful. It was absolutely fantastic that he was able to uh, be religious and devote himself to his beliefs and, and God and then take the, uh, the intensity from that and the passion he had and then put it into something like, you know, as trivial as a game of football because it just shows that once you put your mind to something and you commit yourself, doesn't matter at what aspect of life it is, you can literally accomplish anything because of it and he's proven that day in and day out. It was official. Tim Tebow was a Bronco. But what kind of impression could he make in Denver? I'll tell you the one thing I'll never forget about Tebow was the very first his rookie year. And uh, I was waiting to talk to him one-on-one. -on -one. It was after a training camp session and they had double, they had two sessions. You know, and, and Tebow would be first in the conditioning sprints at the end of practice, both morning and afternoon. And then afterwards, he'd throw extra you know, throw extra passes so he could work on his mechanics. And then he would be in the, he'd say hi to the kids in the tent. They had a little VIP tent. And then he went and he worked out some more. He did crunches in the end zone. Uh, he did these sprints. He did these agility work with the trainer, assistant trainer that was on the, the team staff. I had to wait 45 minutes. It was, it got dark. I had to wait 45 minutes uh, for him to get done. And finally, he did give, graciously give me five, six minutes of his time, and he was nice. I don't know if he's a championship caliber quarterback, but I will do tell you this, I'd like him on my side. Because if I need a play, say for two or three yards for the money, I don't mind him having the ball. Is he a great passer? Absolutely not. They looked at him like this, you know, uh, leadership on a scale of, you know, one to 10 was maybe a 12. Competitiveness, you know, a, a 10. His will, his desire, his character, all of these things were off the charts. His athleticism as a quarterback, off the charts. The one thing he had was flaws in his throwing motion. He would bring the football down by his waist, which was very poor mechanics for an NFL quarterback. And it was a slow release that came from a weird angle as opposed to right over the top by the ear. Uh, he's a little tardy recognizing when the receiver is going to be open, when the defense is going to break down and the hole is going to be there. So it's, and it's hard to get that recognition. The only way you can get the reading down is through 
reputation and time and experience, so that doesn't come right away. And if you look at him, he is a mechanical mess at times, his footwork and his uh, release. They're not tied together the way uh, they automatically are for others. They had to reconstruct his delivery. They had to reconstruct his fundamentals as far as a five-step drop back into the pocket. And most people who know football think that you can't do that. Going into his rookie season in 2010, questions remained about Tebow's ability to make it in the pros. Well, first of all, I remember his first preseason game against Minnesota. I mean, he was, I mean, he was electric. I mean, he was all over the place. Uh, uh, it was exciting, uh, not always in a good way, but uh, he was the best player on the field. And then he did that dive to the end zone and got his ribs uh, crushed, and he got hurt on that play. And then there was a lot of talk about you can't play the way he played in college with his type of style. and and hold up in the NFL. When you have games where he's running, has more runs than he has passes, you're saying, uh, what kind of quarterback is this guy? Then in the uh, his last three game audition, very first quarter, only one time in history, had a quarterback uh, ran for a 40 yard touchdown and passed for a 30 yard touchdown. Only one time in history in a game, Michael Vick did that. Tebow did it in his very first quarter as a starter against the Oakland Raiders. You know, as, as if to say, well, what, what else you got? What else you got for me to do? I mean, he, the guy's athleticism and, and, and f human feats are really uh, something extraordinary. And then the second game, he overcame the 23-0 deficit to come back against Houston. That was kind of the start of Tebow time, where he rallied the team late. And then against San Diego in the final, he almost did the same thing. So, uh, uh, yeah, I, th I thought he was very impressive in his audition, enough to where I thought it made sense for the team to go forward in 2011 and find out what they had. He's thrown into the, to the you know, the, the season's not going well, so they give him the starting job. At the end of the season, his coach gets fired. Then there's the NFL lockout. Despite his excellent audition in the pros, Tebow went into the 2011 season with a lot of questions and challenges facing him. Well, it, it, it seemed like the, the team and the organization was uh, in disarray. John Fox is a new coach. John Elway's a new coach. They looked at Kyle Orton in training camp. They looked at Tim Tebow throwing the ball all over the place in training camp, and they made Kyle Orton the starter. When Kyle Orton comes onto the field starting the 2011 season, he has half the city against him, and he's supposedly playing for the Denver Broncos, but the fans are chanting, Tebow, Tebow, Tebow. And the next thing you know, they're one and three, and it forces the hand of the organization to put in Tim Tebow. John Fox tried, still didn't give up on that Charger game in game five. They're down 23-10. Uh, they're one and three. He put in Tebow for a spark. And, uh, you know, the rest became 2011 history for the Broncos. Now, Tim Tebow in that game was not spectacular. If I remember correctly, he was maybe 4 of 10 for 79 yards. He was not setting it on fire. But he did have one touchdown pass, and he ran for a touchdown. He did what Kyle Orton could not do. He just was magical in that fourth quarter. And it was at home in Denver, and he had the place electrified. And he brought the team back. The Broncos lose, but the crowd is just chanting Tebow's name. I've never seen a loss, a, a team where, where a loss uh, felt so good to the team in defeat. I mean, Tebow really energized a franchise that needed it. The game against the Chargers allowed Tebow to shine and show his innate abilities under pressure. Tebow earned himself another start, and that led into the bye week and then the Miami game. If the game against the Chargers had been a nail-biter, well, that was nothing compared to what went down in Miami when Tebow led Denver against the Dolphins. Well, I remember I went into that locker room and, uh, you know, because we got to get that game story in as, as soon as the game's over. 
And so you right ahead a little bit. And uh, I went in that locker room and told a bunch of the linemen, uh, you should have seen the story that won't make the paper uh, because it sure looked terrible. I mean, I remember he was four out of 14 uh, with uh, about six minutes left to go in the game. And he wasn't just missing passes. He was, he, he was throwing passes into the band, you know, into the stand. He was, he was way uh, inaccurate in that game. I remember how horrible Tim Tebow was for three and a half quarters. The comeback to win the game only means something if you put it in the context of how bad Tim Tebow was up until that point. And then the switch went on. And all of a sudden, he started completing passes. And he was accurate. And he uh, uh,
what he's always kind of done. And, and, you know, it, his faith is as important to him uh, as, as anyone's faith is to them. He's just a little bit more comfortable talking about it than maybe some other people are. But, uh, you know, if you've been around Tim for any length of time, you realize he's as genuine in that as he is in everything else. I think it's fantastic that we have like a role model of this caliber to look up to. And even kids nowadays are be like, you know what, I want to be like Tim. He always does the right thing. People sometimes make fun of him for it, but in my eyes, he, uh, he's just, you know, he's that committed to himself. He's that committed to his beliefs and we should all learn from that. Tebow had turned the Broncos around, but the real test came in the playoffs facing the almighty Pittsburgh Steelers in what has become known as the John 316 game. The big thing is he had finished the season and, and, you know, playing terribly. John Fox was even talking about pulling him in the playoff game if he didn't play well in the first half. He played well in the first half. He had a 20 to six lead against the Steelers who came in a, a big favorite, eight and a half point favorite. They had the number one defense in the NFL. Tebow was playing terribly. They were gonna eat him up for lunch. And of course, Tebow answered the challenge and played very well. He was throwing the ball down the field. He was making precise reads. He was precise passes. He was on the money. Elway wanted him to, to, to pull the trigger, and sure enough, in overtime, first play, beautiful, perfect pass to Demarius Thomas across the middle, and Demarius Thomas did the rest, and it was just an exciting, exhilarating moment. Uh, you know, tied for the top moment in, in new stadium history, new being uh, uh, you know, Sports Authority Field at Mile High. They moved in there in 2001. It turns out that Tim Tebow passed for 316 yards. His per pass yardage average was 31.6 yards, 316. And all types of other numerology, but that's why it's known as the John 316 game, as in like the biblical verse, John 316. So God, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. And so and then the game took on mythical proportions. I think the best highlight was the playoff game when they went into uh, overtime and he threw the touchdown pass. And I'm thinking to myself, people say this guy can't throw. That throw was on the money, wins the game. But that pass in overtime was as good a pressure pass as I've ever seen. So the people that say, you know, the guy can only run the football, he can't pass the football, I think they're dead wrong. Miraculously, Tim Tebow had led the Broncos back into the national spotlight. But now, they face the New England Patriots in their toughest fight ever. Whatever concentration there was on Tebow versus Tom Brady, the fact is the Broncos had no one who could cover a tight end. And New England had two great tight ends and Rob Gronkowski and Aaron Hernandez. And sure enough, those guys just ate up the Bronco defense. Why Tim Tebow was able to have success and win games late had largely to do with Denver and his defense keeping him in the game. As long as defense was doing its job, then Tim Tebow had a shot at the end. But in the game against the Patriots, it was over by halftime. Tebow really never had a chance in that game. Um, he wound up, did get hurt. It might not have been the best system for him. It might not have been the best team, but uh, he definitely showed his determination and the will to get the job done. And overall, I think he did. Oh, the jury's always still out on Tebow. Tebow won six games in a row and the jury was still out on Tebow. Uh, and it always will be for a guy like that. He, you know, every time he would win a game or play well, you know, can he do it again? Or can he sustain it? You know, Tebow's the type of quarterback that everyone thinks there's an expiration date on a guy like that. To date, the critics have been wrong. He has won, he has been successful. He took a bad team to the playoffs. And he was the reason. I don't care what they say, it wasn't the defense, it wasn't John Fox, it wasn't Elway, it was Tebow. Tim Tebow took the Broncos to the playoffs. Despite his miraculous success during the 2011 season, Tebow was traded to the New York Jets. I think a lot of Bronco fans will regret the trade. Uh, 
Elway uh, did not regret the trade. There's no question about that. When he got the first opportunity to trade Tebow away, he did just that. It's going to be a bit of a circus here in New York. There's no question. And in the past, the Jets have put guys in in a quarterback situation where you say to yourself, how can that be? That's the right size city, the biggest city in America that can handle Tebow. And uh, I do think he'll wind up being their starting quarterback before season's end. For me, it's not about changing anything. It's not about being anyone different. It's about being who I am and who I've always been. When they traded for Tebow, I, for one, was shocked. I'm thinking, why Tebow? What's he going to do? I mean, Sanchez is a top-round draft choice, a proven winner. I asked myself, why? It just doesn't make any sense at all. Uh, I think he's a better quarterback than Sanchez. Uh, he's not a better passer than Sanchez, but he's a better quarterback. The thing about Tebow is he's going to need a coach and an organization to commit to his style of play. Sanchez, to me, is a bona fide NFL starter. But if he's having a game, Sanchez, with one or two interceptions, I guarantee you that if you're at the stadium, that's what you're going to hear. Tebow, Tebow, Tebow. New York is the biggest sports market in the country. It is also the toughest. Can Tebow work his charm with the notorious New York Jets and their infamously unforgiving fans? I've been doing this sort of business since the mid-70s uh, on television. I've never seen a guy who's done so little professionally that has come to New York and has just been welcomed. And never mind the talk of the town, there's newspapers that are signing reporters every day to follow him. Very thankful for the opportunity to play for such a great organization. And, you know, it's just uh, my dream and a passion to help them out. And thankful that they uh, uh, believed in me and stuck with me throughout this whole crazy um, process. He's going to a team that, uh, you know, is dealing with uh, locker room issues from last year, uh, obviously. And, and there's no better person in a locker room at any level of sports than Tim. And Tim's a guy that is so competitive that he doesn't want to come off the field. They're winning 150 to nothing. He really doesn't want to come off the field. You know, so it's kind of hard to, to, you know, to be a backup quarterback to Tim. Everybody that puts on a uniform, you want to go out there and you want to play. Um, that's why you play the game of football, and I'm excited to be a Jet. The way that they're going to use him, you know, is in a variety of roles. You know, it'll be interesting to see how that goes because you've ought to automatically got a quarterback controversy with Mark Sanchez and Tim Tebow and and the first second that Sanchez skips a pass everyone's going to be calling for Tim Tebow and that's really not a great situation for Tim, Mark Sanchez or Rex Ryan either. I'm excited to be a Jet um, you know to go out there and to help this team any way that I can and whatever my role is however I can expand that role you know I'm going to try to do that and and every day in practice I'm going to go out there and and compete and try to get better as a quarterback and try to figure out any ways possible to help this team any way that I can. From a marketing standpoint even a football standpoint you're not asking him to lead the team. That's Mark Sanchez's job. But at the same time, he does add a different dimension, an added dimension, which makes that team that much more formidable moving forward. Eventually, he's going to get his time on the field. Uh, and, you know, and, and I think if the Jets are smart, they'll run some really uh, intelligent plays for him because he has so much talent. They could have him in as a wideout, and they could use him as a fake, they can use him as a running back. He can bring so many things to the table, which makes him interesting. First and foremost, I've always said that I'm a football player first and then a quarterback, although, you know, that is my dream, that's what I want to be, and that's what I believe I am as a quarterback. Um, but, you know, however I can help the team, however I can make a difference, um, however they can use me, I'll be um, open to it and work as hard as I can every time I step on that field. I think that uh, it will not change Tim Tebow. Uh, I think Tim Tebow is so grounded that uh, he will make an impression on people. And those that he doesn't, so be it. But I really feel that uh, there will be a lot of positive come from his presence there. Well, you know what? New Yorkers, I think, are more sympathetic and more caring 
than a lot of people give New Yorkers credit for. Uh, I don't know how the religion thing is gonna stand up in New York because it's such a melting pot. You can find any denomination here in New York. But as far as popularity is concerned, what's not to like about the guy? If he gets a chance to play and he does poorly, they'll do it. Simple as that. And I feel that whatever booze he receives, whether it's you know on a in a game, and uh, you know he, that's a part of the game. For every, every football game I play, I always get a little bit I always get a little bit nervous, and that's something that. Um, excites me and I think that's something that I play better when I have more on the line and um, that's, that's something that I've always tried to thrive on and, um, and when that feeling goes away that'll be, probably be the time when I stop playing football. One of the guys that plays for the Jets, Darrell Rivas, is a guy that likes to talk about himself. His nickname, Rivas, probably one of the better defensive backs in the game, his nickname is The Island. Well, when Tebow comes and practices for the first time with the Jets and is around the locker room, uh, Darrell Rivas, of all people, says, this guy's a born leader. And that I was shocked to hear. And then Rivas goes on to say that he's the first guy in the weight room. Uh, even when he's at lunch, he's a leader. So if Darrell Rivas says that about Tim Tebow, then I gotta believe other players kinda like him a lot. From everything you've already heard, he's already started to stabilize that locker room. That was in major turmoil at the end of last season. And when the players did the top 100 players this year, you heard some of his former teammates saying he's a leader, he's a winner. Anytime I get the opportunity, I always um, thank my Lord and Savior Jesus Christ because that is the most important thing to me. With Tim Tebow in New York, I have yet to see any negativity. And the only thing possible would be is if you get on him because he wears his religion on his sleeve. Other than that, this guy comes to New York like a knight in shining armor. And then whatever happens in life, good or bad, um, whether you're the hero or the goat, um, whether you like it or not, um, you know that someone has a plan for your life. As far as the National Football League is concerned, what's the old expression? Tim Tebow is good for business. And why do you think that the Jets have sold so many jerseys with his number on it? Because he is good for business. And if I had to come up with a nickname for Tim Tebow, it would be Tim, good for business, Tebow. Many people have wondered if Tebow's celebrity, mixed with his deep faith, has any place on the football field. Uh, the league, uh, you know, it, he doesn't hurt. Uh, I'll say that. I don't know how, you know, for a few years ago, uh, uh, Roger Goodell, as commissioner, wanted to badly clean up the act. There was all kinds of incidents off the field, and he came down harshly on so many guys. And then along comes the All-American guy, Tim Tebow, uh, who lives up, you know, to the American dream by winning the games at the end. There's a lot of Tebow resentment, part of which is he's very upfront about his Christianity. He was homeschooled as a child. He was, he's been very separated in, in many ways from regular folks. How many people actually get to tour the world or do missionary work before they're 22? How many people win national championships also before they're 22 or get drafted in the first round of the NFL? Each step of Tim Tebow's life, he has been successful. I mean, he was like a human Disney movie every week um, where people uh, were down on him and he was down and out and it looked all bad for the hero and by gosh, at the end, the hero comes through and the people who knocked him, uh, the villains, uh, you know, s slunk off uh, at the end of the movie and that's how Tebow was week in and week out. I don't know how it hurt the NFL. And he captivated people, not just in Denver, but across the nation with his type of play and the way he pulled them out at the end. They said he couldn't make in the pros, and he did. So what does the future hold for this phenomenal quarterback and his astounding ability to beat the odds? If an NFL coach or organization commits to him and lives with his flaws and sticks by him, uh, even in the tough times, I think the guy can win. If they don't, 
then his career could be uh, briefer than it should be. He's going to have to be a starting NFL quarterback. You know, otherwise he, he may only be in the league six, seven, eight years. Because of how big his persona is, NFL teams will think it's not worth it. So it's a, he's kind of in a boom or bust type of uh, career window. The thing that I always said about Tim is he needs a little bit of time. But if you give him the time, I think he'll develop into a, a pretty good quarterback in the NFL. And, you know, the fact that he hasn't had sort of the, 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 the career path I thought he should have taken has probably stunted him a little bit because he's had to deal and learn with it on the fly. And I think, you know, had he been able to learn behind like a Peyton Manning or a Tom Brady, or like I said, a Drew Brees, that that would have been so much better for him in terms of his development. It'll be interesting if, if, if Tebow does bring a team to the Super Bowl, then he, he would change the game. If he doesn't uh, bring a team to the Super Bowl, then it probably have no impact on the game as a whole, but it was a heck of a ride while it lasted. His success is more like it is an instructive lesson for everyone else, despite the circumstances, on the field, off the field, with God in your heart, you can win. Tim Tebow has earned the love of football fans everywhere. This athletic dynamo has challenged us to reach for the stars and work harder for our dreams while staying true to faith and family. Through it all, he has shown us that with love, loyalty, and respect, you can beat the odds no matter what others think. And in the fourth quarter, when things look darkest, you can always pull off that big play and change the course of history.